Today we're going to be discussing funeral arrangements and everything that's involved with making them. The first thing that I would like to discuss in regards to funeral arrangements is who is allowed to make funeral arrangements. I know that seems like a strange question, but in context of, of funeral business, it really is not. Um, the major problem that I have seen over the years of doing this is simply we have many times a family member that comes in because they've experienced the loss of a loved one and after a few moments of sitting down with them in the arrangement office we find out they really were not even married. Um, the family member is under the impression because they've been with their partner for 30 some odd years or however long the time frame may be that they are allowed to make funeral arrangements. Certain states will allow this, and these states have what we call a common law marriage clause or law that basically, depending on the state, after a certain number of years, you are considered a married couple. State of Nevada, however, does not recognize this law. We do not have common marriage or common law marriage. As a result, with these family members that come in, I as a funeral professional am not able to make these arrangements with these family members. And I've been asked many times, how do we correct this problem? One of the easiest and most simplest ways to correct this is to take a few moments with your partner, go down, see an attorney, and you can just have a will drawn up that basically puts you and your partner into a position that after your death, the partner is legally able to make funeral arrangements or to handle your estate after the time of your death. This is usually a very inexpensive fix and it's a very effective fix. If you have this and it is a, a legal document from your attorney, uh, at that time when you come in and sit down at the arrangement room with your funeral director, you hand the director that paperwork and we can proceed. Many times I'm asked by families, what do I need to bring? Well, if your loved one was in the armed forces, um, an honorable discharge from the United States Armed Forces, you are going to have a form called a DD-214. This is basically the form that states, A, you were enlisted in the United States military, and B, you were honorably discharged from the United States military. This enables you for several different things. Um, it, hands down, it's going to get you what you rightly deserve, and that is your American flag in honor and memory of your loved one. The next thing, depending on the funeral home that you're working with, may or may not give you some form of a discount because your loved one was a veteran of the United States military. Um, the other aspects of that is just basically what we use for filing our death certificate. There's some very vital information that is typically on those DD-214 forms that we use as a funeral home. So that's the number one thing you're going to need to look for in the event your loved one was in the United States military. Next things you're going to need to know. In the event, for example, I pass away, my family's going to come into the funeral home. The first thing they're going to need to know, where was I born? What city? What state? When was I born? You'll need to know my birth date. You'll also need to know who my parents were. Now, my dad is going to be sometimes easier for some families than what my mom because every state requires not your mother's married name but they want they would want my mother's maiden name now for many families that's going to take a little research and I've had more than not that family comes in and I ask them what was his or her mother's maiden name oh we don't know um, these are all things that you're going to need to research another thing you're going to need to know is my social security number a lot of times that's going to take a little bit of looking and hunting and, and some research to find that information. So I urge you to maybe make a file and, and have everything handy where in the event of your death your family is aware of this file and they readily have all of this information handy. Several other things that you're going to need to know or have when you come in for the arrangement setting. Are you going to be viewing your loved one? If so, what I always urge is if you can bring the clothing in that you would like your loved one dressed in. Um, many times I've had families tell me, well, you know, my son was uh, not a suit wearing guy. He always loved t-shirts or sweatpants, his ball cap, his nose stud, whatever it is, that's fine. 
you do not need to bring a suit for someone who never wore a suit or who really just did not like them. Um, if there are, if there's jewelry or glasses, necklaces, whatever the, the items may be, bring them because these are the items that you correlate your loved one of having. Um, for example, with me, with my glasses, uh, many times family members don't think to bring glasses. And so when you come to view me, if I'm not wearing my glasses, it's not going to look right. You're going to look at that and say, oh, it doesn't really look like him. He doesn't have his glasses. These are things to really think about. And if you're watching this for information for yourself, what I recommend is just make a little list or a little note of what you would want in the event that you were planning your own funeral right now. And these are the things that you would want to wear. These are the things that you want to have with you or on you at the time of your viewing. All very important things to consider and think about. And I think if we all just take a few moments and maybe discuss it with other family members, um, what ring should we bring? Was there a ring in particular perhaps that mom or grandma that enjoyed wearing? Was there a ring that dad liked over the others? Uh, these are all very important things and don't leave those out. There's a reason for a viewing and a portion of that viewing is to memorialize your loved one in such a way that when you walk up and view them, they look like your loved one as, as you remember. Burial or cremation. What disposition are you looking at choosing? Now, many times I've had families sit back and look at me and say, oh, we need to know that right now. Of course you do. This is why we're sitting here. If we were coming in to talk about the weather, that'd be one thing, but you're coming in to make funeral arrangements. It's vital that when you walk through the door, you have a pretty good understanding as to which way you're going to want to go. Now, having questions in regards to funerals and cremations and memorial services and burials, that's all fine, and you can make your educated decision at that time, but before you leave, you're going to have to have a pretty good idea as to what you're going to want. The other reason you're going to want to know between burial and cremation is because depending on the answer that you give your funeral director, that is the direction that the arrangements are going to go from that point on. If, for example, you tell me we're looking at a, a direct cremation, we don't wish to have any services, I'm not going to spend any more time talking about services, talking about churches, asking you about clergy, finding out about musicians and flowers and all of these other things that with a traditional funeral service we're going to be discussing. So the sooner you have in your mind which way you're going to want to go, the better everything is going to go. The quicker this arrangement is going to, to be and the less stressful it's going to end up being on you as a family. Now we need to choose a casket or a cremation container. You're going to probably be either led into a casket showroom or be handed a computer module where maybe on a laptop you're going to be looking at different casket selections or cremation containers and it's going to be very intimidating. You're going to see a huge variety of different types of merchandise, uh, a huge increase in cost as far as nicer merchandise is X amount of thousands of dollars as opposed to a couple hundred dollars. Many times I've been asked, does it matter? Do, do I need to spend $8,000 on a casket for my loved one or is this $1,200 casket going to suffice? As a funeral professional, I cannot answer that question for you. The best thing that I can do is give you the information that's based on product value, what the product is, what it has to offer, and then it's up to you as a family to make the final decision as to what you want to do. Do not put yourself into a position that you're going to be without food or without a home for a very long time because you have a $20,000 funeral bill. That is not anything that any good funeral professional is going to want to lead you into. Um, we have a, a wide variety of different products and as a result there's a huge difference between cost on low end and high end. And I hate to relate the funeral business to the car business, but 
in some aspects, I think it's, it's worthy of mentioning, and this is one of them. If you go to a car lot and you're looking for a used car, and you have, say, for example, $5,000 that you can spend on a car, you're going to find cars that probably range anywhere from $500 up to $60,000. Now, do you need to spend $60,000 on a vehicle so you can go to the grocery store and go to work and take the kids to school every day? Of course you don't. You need a vehicle that's going to suit your needs. You need a vehicle that is going to be dependable, that you're content with, that you're going to be happy with in making that purchase. Um, caskets are no different. Neither are urns or cremation containers. They are there for one purpose only, and that purpose is sheltering of human remains. <laughs> now, when sitting down and making your selection, keep these things in mind. You're going to see things, such, especially with caskets. For example, caskets. Let's talk about uh, sealer caskets as opposed to non-sealer caskets. Um, what is that? Basically, your sealer caskets have a rubber gasket in them that claim to keep moisture and air and everything else out of the casket. Okay, the fine print that is worthy of noting, depending on the environment in which the casket is being buried, greatly influences the effectiveness of that seal. For example, if you were going to be doing a burial in a desert cemetery, let's again pick Nevada for a great example, um, our local cemetery here, we do not require the use of a, a grave liner or a vault. So basically, what that means is, by law, we can dig a grave, take that casket, set it directly down in the grave, and cover it back up. Nothing is there to protect that casket. Is that seal going to last a long time? Is it going to last forever? Of course not. And depending on how much moisture is there, depending on uh, the elements as far as uh, soil is concerned, it, there are many, many things that are going to influence the effectiveness of that seal. So keep that in mind. If you're going into a wall niche or you're going into a mausoleum somewhere, that seal is going to last a whole lot longer than it is, say, for example, in a desert cemetery. Or maybe in a cemetery where there's a lot of grass and there's a lot of watering going on. These things all greatly influence how the integrity of that casket is going to hold up. My typical morning would start by taking a look at the paperwork as far as calls that may have come in throughout the night. Um, I would always start my day by giving every family member that we had a phone call. And basically what that phone call was, was to answer any questions that may arise, but also to try and, and schedule a time for that family to come in and meet with me to make funeral arrangements. The worst thing in the world that a family can do to a funeral director or to a funeral home is to just walk in the door and expect to make arrangements. It's unrealistic to assume that when you walk in the door, we can all stop what we're doing and meet with you. I, that, that, that sounds very cold, I understand. But you also have to realize that most likely, depending on the funeral home that you're, that you're working with, most generally speaking, funeral homes have an average of anywhere from two, some of them 25, 30 cases a week. There are some funeral homes that do that within a day's time. So to walk in the door with all of your things in hand and expect to just sit down with a funeral director or a funeral professional and make funeral arrangements is very unrealistic. And what's going to end up happening is chances are they're going to reschedule you and you're going to have to leave or you're going to be sitting there waiting for an awful long time either for a service to get done, that funeral director to finish what they're doing as far as meeting with the family, whatever the story may be. So my day would start by making a phone call and trying to schedule a set time for you as a family to come in and meet with me and make these arrangements. Um, the other question I've been asked many times is, okay, when we come in, can we see dad or can we see our loved one? The answer to that question is, at least from my end, always no. Now there are funeral directors and professionals out there that have no problem in doing this. They will tell you right away, absolutely, you know, I'll have everything ready for you. Uh, they may say, you know, it's 
early, you want to come in at 9 o'clock, it's 8 o'clock in the morning right now, let's push this back to 11 o'clock so that way I have time to get everything ready. And most of the time families are pretty happy with that. The reasoning that I give as far as telling a family member no at that point, I like to have 24 hours from the time that I sat down and met with the family. And there are many reasons for that. Number one being, in talking with you, I can get a better idea as far as your loved one's life, as far as who your loved one was, the kinds of things your loved one liked. The other thing I can get from you at that arrangement is hair. How did your loved one like their hair? Uh, another great thing to bring with you is a photograph, if you, especially if you want to do a viewing or there's going to be an open casket. Always, always bring at least one really good photograph. If you have more than one, three or four even, that's great. Um, this helps us in the funeral home to get everything set exactly the way you want it. Um, hairstyle, the way they did their clothing, the way their jewelry was put on. And all of these other things are going to greatly help us into, get this, into getting this done the way you foresee it or the way you want it done. So after the, the initial arrangement is over, what I like to do is, I, again, I'll take a good 24 hours to ensure that all of our staff has time to get the viewing done properly. If we're going to embalm, that gives us plenty of time to do the embalming. If not, that gives us plenty of time to make everything go as smoothly as possible. The last part of the arrangement is by far the hardest part for me as a funeral professional. And that is after we've heard all of the stories, after we've sat down for an hour or two, or in some cases three hours, depending on the complexity of the services that, that you're requesting. And we get everything figured out. You've chosen a casket, you've chosen an urn, you've chosen all of the different merchandise, flowers or whatever it may be, you've ordered death certificates and all of these other things. The final stage of this is for me to put together a contract <clears throat> that basically lists all of the services that we have discussed in a chronological order or in a, a an order that makes sense as far as you as a consumer. And at the bottom of that is the final total. When it comes to giving you as a family member the final total, many funeral professionals and directors out there have a real hard time with telling you, okay, the final total is $12,597.18. Um, how would you like to pay for that today? Um, that today word is a very harsh word. And not only have you lost a family member, but you have now all of a sudden been set with reality of, I need to come up with almost $13,000. Very difficult not only for you as a family member here, but for me as well, to, to expect you to just come up with payment right now. There are programs out there that will assist you with funerals, and they will assist you with burial or cremation. One thing to keep in mind, however, if, if in using these programs, most generally speaking, they are going to cover cremation. So we're looking at a minimum cremation container. Most funeral homes use a very heavy gauge cardboard box. That is a minimum cremation container. There is no lining, there is no pillow, there are no frills, there's, there's nothing to it. It's a cardboard box, end of story. And many families use that. It's a great receptacle. It completely incinerates within the cremation process. And there are virtually no byproducts that are, that are left over from it. The, Second thing is they will generally issue through these programs, and I'm talking programs, for example, say social services. Uh, social services usually offer funeral homes at X amount of dollars for a direct cremation or X amount of dollars for an immediate burial. They will also include typically the minimum earn that's required by the state. In the state of Nevada, there are several different options, and I'm sure there are in many other states as well. But you're not going to get a $500 cherry or oak urn. It's not going to happen. The other thing they're not going to accommodate you in typically is a funeral service. Now, if the funeral director or the funeral home decides to help you as a family, to give you a service, 
that is entirely up to them. I do think it's worth noting that when using programs such, such as social services, in the event that you come back and you upgrade the art, there is a chance that social services or the county will end up billing you for the entire cost of that service that they paid because in their in their minds or in the way the law is written depending on the area you're you are in if you have the money to upgrade and earn for three or four hundred dollars you could have in essence put that three or four hundred dollars in towards the disposition of your loved one thus helping the county and not putting such a a heavy burden on them so these are all things to keep in mind the final thing that we're going to discuss in regards to finances of funerals the funeral director or professional that you're meeting with ha should have a list of different programs that are available to you as a family and it also is the responsibility to a certain point of your funeral professional to assist you in finding financing that may be available to help you when it comes time for the disposition of your loved one. Um, several funeral homes handle this slightly differently. There are some funeral homes that will do in-house financing. These are all things that I urge you before the time comes or before you sit down and make those arrangements. Give your funeral home a call. Give your cremation society a call. Find out the answers to these questions. And that's a great thing to do when you're price shopping, when you're making phone calls to decide which funeral home would I choose to go with. Find out what kinds of payment options they have, if any, and what programs are available to you in the event that you feel you might be needing some assistance. I hope this video was helpful. There are still other topics in regards to making arrangements that we'll hit on at a later date but I feel that this should give you a pretty good foundation at least to start. And as always, if you have any questions in regards to funerals in general, making arrangements or whatnot, give me an email. My email is majorpell at yahoo.com and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for viewing.